So when you love someone, you trust them. And when you love someone, you obey them. When you love someone, you're willing to lay down your life for them. When we show God our love, not through our feelings, which can be fleeting, we, can show, we show them through our actions. We show them through the things that come from having that relationship with them. We, by accepting Christ, have the ability to let God's love shine through our testimonies and our actions. We know that those things, that's bearing fruit. When we live that way, we let our testimonies and our actions show we bear fruit. And Jesus spoke about that in John 15. And we know that when we bear fruit, we're not to boast of ourselves, right? We are, we are to boast in Christ. God gets the glory. It's not us. And love doesn't mean you're going to get everything you want. Sometimes love is seen as correction. And it's important that we understand that. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. Everything we need. We shouldn't be looking to the world to provide to us something that hasn't been given to us already because Christ has given us everything we need. Just, about, just like these testimonies that we talk about with Miss Amy and, and the whole group going to see Eric Blair and everybody rallying around and supporting him and supporting each other, those are the things that Christ has equipped us to do. And only through him do we have the ability to do that. Before I came to Christ, I had no interest in spending time with anybody. I, didn't, I had no interest in that. I want to come home, play my video games maybe, spend time with my kids. I didn't want to associate with anyone. Actually, I'm a pretty introvert person. It's kind of difficult for me to even get up here and preach, or it's difficult for me to even speak out on a lot of things. But coming to know the Lord and Him changing my life has created that boldness in me, and we should see all of that in us as well, knowing that He has given us everything. And such is the will of our Father, and should be our will to ask for His correction that leads to those things. His will and our will should begin to align. That is love between us and Him. That is everlasting love. And only the everlasting can provide that kind of love. But we need to talk about something first before we get into the love and all that stuff. We need to understand the true character of God. And it was pretty awesome this morning at the Quipping Hour. Love comes into the, the topic of conversation a lot. And we talk about love. But God's justice is also love. His correction is also love. Having a healthy fear of God is also part of loving him. And if we don't have that healthy fear, we can't love him. We've seen the contrast in Revelation between the sacrificial God that Jesus is to the God that he is going to reveal himself to be coming soon. Um, in the end, he's somebody that's going to judge all the earth. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be re recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We know, as the word of God instructs us, that God is love, and in his love, he will justify those whom he seeks to justify, and will condemn through his judgment those whom he seeks to condemn. And we need to be willing to understand that. Jesus is the minister of compassion, compassion and justice. And like I said, we need to fear him with healthy respect for who he is, the holy God that he is, and for what he has done. That in itself is love. If we don't do that, then we need to question if we can love Christ. So I just want to go over that before we get into John 15. It's important that we talk about the love of God, but we also need to understand that God is a God of justice, and he needs to be feared. And that fear should produce love in us when we look at who Christ is. Um, we know the book of John is written by the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I know a lot of uh, people equate the book of John. You know, you have different categories for each uh, four of the books of the gospel. John is the book of love, right? You'll see that. That's the prevalent message all throughout the book of John. And uh, just this morning, I was talking to an individual that came in. And he was like, where do I start in the Bible? Where do I start? Well, a long time ago, someone told me when I first come to faith, came to faith in Christ, start with the book of John. Start with John, start with Matthew, Mark, and read all the way through. Because John really talks about all the things that God is about and how he wants to love on us and how he wants to have a relationship with us. He doesn't need it, but he wants it. He wants us to have a relationship with him, and we need him. So we need to remember that. <clears throat> um. And this picture that's painted in John, and John 15 specifically, it's a sharp contrast, and we'll talk about it, between what the world perceives as love and what Jesus says that love is. You know, that was another thing we were talking about in the equipping hour this morning is how 
the churches are getting further and further away from, you know, the truth that is in Christ. And that truth, although it's hard for some people to swallow, that is love. And we need to go out and share that truth. Just like Pastor was saying, when he goes back home, we have to share that truth with those around us. So it's important we do that. Um, another thing that's important in John chapter 14, we have to remember, and for those that, you know, don't know Christ, Jesus in John chapter 14 in verse 6, we all know what he says. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus is not saying, I know the way. He's not saying, come over here, get a pen and paper, and we'll write down some directions, I'll tell you where to go. That's not what he's saying, right? He's not saying, I know the way. He's saying, I am the way. And it's important as we go through and we read through John 15, the first part of John 15, where it talks about abiding the vine, that we remember that Jesus is the way. He doesn't say, I know the way. He is the way. Um, we were reading through that radical book, I don't know, it was probably six, seven months ago. I can't remember who the author was. But just like Pastor was talking about with the Buddhists, you know, and all these people, well, we can accept that, we can accept that. Well, the guy who wrote the book was talking about how he was uh, on mission in Nepal or somewhere over there, and he was sitting with uh, a Muslim cleric, an imam, and a Buddhist monk or priest or, um, you know, whatever their leaders are called. And they're all sitting there talking. Three of them are just sitting around, they're talking, and they're out there trying to reach people and help people out. Well, the Muslim imam is talking about, you know what, we're all here doing the same thing. And he's like, you see that mountain over there? He said, God's on top of that mountain, and we're all just trying to work our way up and climb our way up to the mountain. The Buddhist does it his way. He has all kinds of rules that he follows. He has, you know, if you've studied Buddhism, if you've read up about it at all, there's like some 120 some rules for men, and there's like 215 rules for women that they have to follow in order to reach that path to becoming their own God. That's essentially what it is. And for the Muslim, you know, they're trying to get to Allah, and they believe that through their works that they can make it there. Well, the Christian, I can't remember who wrote the book, but he, it was a great example. He says it's different for the Christian. For the Christian, God has already come down from the mountain. He has come down, and he is taking us up to be with him. Everyone else, every other religion in the world is working to get there. Jesus has already paid the price for us. And that we need to remember that. And as we go through John 15, I want you guys to remember that. As we read through this, I want you to remember that Jesus is the way. He doesn't tell us the way. He's not saying, all right, you see that mountain? Go ahead and climb it. You know, you know what? I'll go ahead and throw in some gear for you. Here you go. No, he's saying, come with me. He's like, I got you. And when you fall down, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to carry you. And we're going to go all the way. We're there. We're going to be there with God. We're here. So we've got to remember that. <clears throat> and when we remember that, and we understand that, there's going to be a righteousness that's produced in us. And as we go through John 15, we'll see what that is. And that's the fruit. And that's the stuff that uh, Brother Brian was talking about last week. So John 15, verse 1 and 2 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. If you know the Lord, then you know that Christ is the vine. We have to abide in him. We cannot be apart from him once we are with him. Paul wrote at the, to the church of Philippi, he said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And basically what that means is in our lives, we need to be living a life that's in closeness with Christ. We should be working closer and closer and closer in our relationship with him as we go through this process of sanctification up until the point of our death to our ultimate glorification with him where we don't have to walk by sight anymore. I mean, walk by faith anymore, right? We can walk by sight and finally be with him. So it's important we remember that. <clears throat> he sustains us, he supports us, and nurtures us through the relationship we have with him by the manifestation of the Holy Spirit within us. And we know that God the Father is the one who has set the course for all his creations creation and sustains his creation through God the Son, Jesus Christ. That's where he's saying, my Father is the vine dresser. God is the one who ultimately sets the course. Jesus tells us that the branch, that is us, we are the branches. You that believe in Christ, you are the branch. You have to abide in Christ. It, if it does not bear fruit, it's what? It's taken away, right? 
So that means that it was never meant to be part of that vine. God is going to take that branch and he's going to take it away. In our lives, we should be producing fruit. We should see fruit. Um, this should be something we need to consider and we need to ask ourselves where we are with our relationship in Christ and how those fruits are manifesting themselves. And we should see those fruits in our lives and we'll go over them. So Brother Brian went through last week, he went through Galatians, right? We know what the fruit of the Spirit is. I gotta be careful not to say the fruits because every time I say the fruits, Tori corrects me and I gotta go back. <laughs> but anyway, it's the fruit of the Spirit and it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but the ones I did want to hit on especially were love, joy, and peace. I think Brother Brian did a great job of going through that last week. There's a lot to be said about love. You know, even in secular cultures and, or in the worldly culture, they tout love. Love is paramount in all things, right? But we must remember that love is not just a feeling, right? It's not like, oh, I, I feel this certain way towards this individual. It's, it's, it's an action, right? Love is an action. What Jesus did on the cross for us was an action, and that is love, and we need to remember that. When we humble ourselves before the Lord and understand the grace that God has given us, then we can only then can we understand the full capacity of love. Before I came to Christ, I had no idea what love was. Every time I loved, it was for my own gain. It was to get something that I wanted. When I love now, I love because God first loved me. That's true love. That's righteousness and love. First John tells us that love is from God and who, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Those are people that know God. Those are the people that truly have the capacity to love. And you'll see that throughout your own life. I mean, we should all be seeing that as we step back and we analyze the things that go on in the world and we see how people are doing things. They're loving because they want to gain something. It's to get something in return. Us as a Christian, when we love, when a true Christian loves, a Christian who abides in the vine that is Christ, he loves, like I said, because it's already been given. And that is true love. It's not about works. It's not about works in an effort to gain something. It's not about us. It's not about us going, oh, I get eternal life if I love Christ. No, it's about thinking about what he has done for us, putting our faith and trust in him, and letting that lead to those wonderful things that come from that relationship. One of those things is love. That's the fruit that's produced from being part of the vine. And uh, I talked about, I was gonna talk about the Thursday night thing uh, in my sermon because that's a great example of love. That's a great example of people sacrificing their time, doing things to go show another brother in Christ love, not because they wanna get something back. It's not because they're gonna get something in return. All these people that go and show up and pray and support each other just as we support each other in the body, these are people that realize it's already been given to me. I need to, to, to obey the Lord because he's already done so much for me. And that's why it's such an awesome picture to see that. And that's actually love, kindness, and goodness. That's a lot of the fruit that came from that. You know, those are some amazing things. Another one is joy. We know joy, and my conceptions of joy were always misconstrued until I came to understand who Christ is. We're going to have joy. We should have joy even in the hard times. Um, you know, we think about it as the good times. Oh, I'm joyful. I'm happy. You know, that's, there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Joy stays with us even through the difficult times, and it's there through the good. And when you abide in Christ and you abide in the vine, you're going to produce the fruit of joy. You're going to have joy. Because you're going to know, even through the tough times, God is with me. God has me. And that in itself should bring you immense joy. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 12, 12, speaking of Jesus, says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand throne of God. Hebrews 12, 12, you see that? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, Here's Jesus taking the cross, going through all this torment. But he had joy. He knew what was set before him. He knew what he had to do. So even in the midst of his struggle, he endured the cross with joy. And we need to endure as well. And the only way for us to endure and to have that kind of joy is by doing what? Abiding in the vine. We have to. Peace. 
We talked about peace this morning in the equipping hour. I think actually somebody brought up Hebrews 12.12 12 this morning as well. Peace. With abiding in the vine, we should have peace. We should have the fruit of peace. Just like our joy set before us, we should have peace through good times and bad. Even when things aren't going our way, the peace of the Lord should overcome us. Philippians 4, 7 says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Beyond all comprehension. We can't even comprehend the peace that God is trying to impart on us. But we know that it is going to guard our hearts and our minds. So we need to rely on that fruit. We need to abide in Christ and know that in the midst of all the things that are going on in our lives, we should have that peace set before us. And like I said, we can go over the rest, but I think Brian did pretty good at going over that last week. One thing I want to uh, mention too is that um, we have to change. We have to see change in our lives. When accepting Christ, all these things come as a result of the change and the regeneration that Christ is starting in us. So we have to remember that. We should see a change in our lives. Uh, you guys have heard my testimony, and we should all share our own testimonies to see the things that God has done in our lives and the things that God continues to do in our lives. I am so thankful to be a part of this church and to be around other believers, not only to, to you know, endure the hard times, but to pray together, to have fellowship together, to hear the testimonies that we all have. I mean, just this morning, going through the equipping hour, it's just beautiful to see all these people that are talking about all these terrible things that can possibly go on in their lives, but they're speaking the truth and righteousness. They're seeking Christ out. They're seeking the vine. They're abiding in the vine to help them through those things. And we need to see that as well. And we need to remember also as part of that, if we are the branch, you think about a tree that's attached to the vine, and we're producing the fruit, we already have everything we need, just as I was talking about in the beginning. We don't necessarily need that fruit because we have the vine. But we're going to have to help each other through all those things and make sure we can do that and stay abiding the vine to produce that fruit. <clears throat> i also tell you that, you know, when I got saved and I came to know Christ, that was not of my own doing. We know that. Um, and God will see that work to the end, especially when we call upon him. And just like I said earlier, God is the vine dresser. He is the one that has set the course. And he takes away the branches that do not bear fruit and do not produce the qualities that display his righteousness and thereby glorify him. So it's important to remember that. By pruning the branches, that's how we grow. When we prune a tree, if you guys, I usually don't prune trees. We had a bunch of trees in my backyard that uh, my wife pruned. I think like three of them died, so I don't know if she did it right or not, but... Uh, you know, when, when God's pruning trees and we're pruning trees, we do it for the, I couldn't do better just to put that out there. So I don't have to hear it later, but <laughs> when we're pruning trees, we need to make sure that we're doing it to produce new growth. God does the same thing for us. He's the vine dresser. He's going to prune us as well, right? We're going to go through things. We're going to go through difficulties and hardships. And there's a reason for that. It's so we can come out and produce more fruit. You know, there's been so many times in my life coming to Christ where there's been things that have seriously sidetracked me and I've gotten discouraged. And it's easy to get like that. But sometimes God puts us through those trials for a reason. Sometimes when God seems so far away, there's a reason why he's pulling back a little bit. Because he wants us to learn, right? He wants to prune us. And the only way for us to be effectively pruned is by abiding in the vine. Jesus is the way. Doesn't tell us the way, he is the way. So we need to remember that. God has never promised, to have, to, promised us to have the things which the world will have us desire. He has promised us, like we said early on, that we will have everything we need. And that promise has been fulfilled by the, by the vine, the blood of the vine, the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to make sure we continue to understand that because we live in a culture where it's no longer relying on the precious vine. I mean, a Christian culture, just like we were talking about earlier. It's no longer about the great I am. It's about making myself the I am and putting God somewhere else. That's what it's about. So we got to make sure we remember that through the good time and the bad. Verse 3 of John 15 says this, and he's talking to the disciples here. He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus was explaining to the disciples that they have, having Christ in the flesh and the truth that he was imparting on them, 
they were being cleansed from the sin and the evilness of the world. Of course, when he died on the cross, that's when all the sin was taken away. His covenant of redemption with us began before the foundations of the earth, only having been completed when he spoke the words, it is finished. That was his plan. We have been clean, cleansed. So we too have been cleansed through the actions of the cross, and we too have the truth. The truth in Christ manifests in our testimonies, in our lives, as we bear the fruit glorifying God, like I was speaking about earlier. The Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death, so that we may prove we serve the living God. We are called to serve the one true and living God. The only way is to do that through the way, the vine, that is Jesus Christ. That is the only way. The next verse, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And this is important here. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Can't, can't reiterate enough. When Jesus speaks about things multiple times in one conversation, he wants to hit it home. He's trying to penetrate there. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. Jesus is saying, you must abide in me. There is no other way, and we need to remember that. All the fruit that we speak of, all the righteousness that exudes from God, cannot be understood and cannot be displayed for his glorification unless we have Christ. We must abide in the vine. For apart from him, we can do what? Nothing. We can't do anything. Before I got saved, apart from him, I wasn't doing anything to glorify God. I was only glorifying myself. Yeah, there were things I did in my life that looked good to the world. Oh, okay, well, you're, you're taking care of somebody else's kids. Wow, you're a great guy. You're a fantastic guy. No, I was doing that so people will go, hey, you're a great guy. You're a fantastic guy for taking care of these kids. In no way did it glorify God whatsoever. I could not glorify God. It's not possible for us to produce fruit and glorify God unless we abide in the vine, and that's what Jesus is telling us here. My life was an empty shell until I was born again. I didn't know what life was about. I didn't even know what my purpose was until I came to know Christ. Being a follower of Christ, um, life takes on a different meaning. And that's exactly what he was telling Nicodemus that night when saying that we must be born again. We have to. But we also have to remember that there are those who claim to abide in Christ that don't. And those are the branches that are going to be gathered up and cast into the fire. We know in Matthew 7, the Lord says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. It is not possible for us to do the will of the Father unless we abide in the vine that is Christ. We cannot. There are those who will appear that they are, but they're not. Eventually, God knows their heart. God knows what's going to happen. And at the end, just like we're learning in Revelation, and we're going to continue to learn next week when we pick back up on it, that God will come and cast them into the fire. John 6.37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. If we come to Jesus and we come to him with love, he's not going to cast us out. When we come to him with faith and trust and obedience, understanding the sacrifice that he made for us in love, he's not going to cast us out. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to abide in him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So prove to be my disciples. Prove. He wants us to bear fruit. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full, made full. So he says, ask whatever you wish. Is Jesus saying that all of our desires will be given to us? I'm going to put a little disclaimer out here because this is not prosperity gospel I'm about to say. Is Jesus saying that he's going to give everything to us that we desire? 
In a sense, he is. If you truly desire to glorify God, if you desire to glorify God and your life is to live a purpose of glorifying him, then yes, you will be given that. He is going to equip us with everything we need to glorify the Father. It's so misconstrued because, you know, the prosperity gospel, as we went through the gospel video, people are like, okay, well, if I just pray to God, Jesus is going to give me whatever I want. You know, like in Africa, all that prosperity gospel is hitting hard over there. Let me pray for some chickens. I didn't get my chickens. I'm turning away from the Father. We got to be careful with that stuff. But Jesus says that we will get those things as long as it's something that's aligned with the will of God. And we have to remember that. That doesn't mean that we can't desire things. But when you truly know Christ and you're abiding in the vine in the midst of a trial, struggle, or anything, you're going to only want the one thing that's going to come uh, that produces fruit, and that's Christ to come into your life and to produce something that glorifies God. So it's important we remember that. Uh, when we live a life that seeks to glorify God, we are then bearing much fruit. All the fruit that Christ is speaking of, the things that Paul, Paul spoke of in Galatians, and so much more, should be used in a way that puts the focus on God and not on ourselves. Boast not of yourselves. Boast in Christ. We have to boast in him. And he says exactly that. I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Abide in my love. Keep my commandments. The only way to keep his commandments is to abide in his love. To abide in him. Understand what he has done for us. We love him, we must remember, because he has first loved us. And what happens as a result? The same joy, the same joy that Jesus endured the cross with will live in us. And that's amazing. If you are his, if you are his disciple, disciple, if you're a true disciple of Christ and you're abiding in the, in the vine, your desires will become the same as his. To do one thing and one thing only. Live a life that glorifies God. We were created to glorify God. Pick up your cross. You have to pick up your cross. That's the one way to do it. Pick up the cross. Abide in the vine. He wants us to do that. That's how we produce fruit. Uh, when you look at the marvelous things of the universe, I, sometimes I like it when Pastor gets up here and he starts talking about, oh, the earth's spinning at like 10,000 miles per hour and doing all this stuff. Yeah, it paints a beautiful picture. You think about all the things that God has created. All the things in the world, the universe, the things that we can't even comprehend, the things that God is revealing to us throughout our lives through this process of sanctification, all the beautiful things going to see Eric Blair on Thursday night, the fellowship that we have here, the smiles, the people coming up, greeting each other, loving on each other, new people coming to church, new people coming to faith every day, baptisms, all the things that come from abiding in the vine. Those are truly remarkable, amazing, beautiful things. And we need to be producing fruit that leads to those things. Things that glorify the Father. And we need to remember that. <clears throat> when God looks upon his creation, I hope that he is well pleased. I know that he is well pleased with those who have accepted Christ. I know that he is. There are things that go on in this world that are pretty bad, terrible. And when we abide in the vine, we should be able to see those things, not only in the lives of those around us, but also in our own lives. We need to be going back to God asking him to reveal the truth in our own life of how we can live further and further to glorify him. The only way to do that is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Like I said, he did, he's not telling us the way. He says, I am the way. He is divine. So let us live our lives in truth, not compromising, holding fast to the things that Christ has imparted onto us. He is the vine and we are the branches. We are in him and he is in us. We need to continue to surrender ourselves to God so we can be pruned, so we can grow, so we can glorify him more and more with each passing day until the day of our final glorification with Christ when we come face to face with him and no longer have to walk by faith but can walk by sight. So who are we to the great I am? If we abide in the vine that is Jesus Christ, we are his children, and we are loved. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all the mercies that you give us day by day, Father. I pray that we grow closer and closer to you and through your son, Jesus Christ, that is divine, Father, that we're producing fruit day in and day out. And Father, if there's any area in our life where we're lacking and we're not producing fruit, I ask that you show it to us. 
that you prune us, God, so we can glorify you more and more. It's in Jesus' mighty name that I pray. Amen.